the living Lord. It's good to see you here again today, and I thank you for coming. Your presence is indeed a blessing. I'm continuing on the message. I began last week pressing into the presence of God, knowing God. And I have three scriptural texts. Exodus 33, 18, Moses says to God, please show me your glory or your face. Philippians 3, 10, Paul says, I want to know him. Psalm 25, verse 4, David says, show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your path. And so last week I said to press into God's presence means to be persistent. And to push past the obstacles, to, to embrace God and to move forward. It means to advance and to follow after the Lord. It means that you are in hot pursuit of the Lord. I also said that we are living in a time when knowing God is very vital to our spiritual survival and making it into heaven. Because with the coming forth of technology and the internet and the web and, you know, YouTube and Periscope and Snapchat and all of the social media apps out there, there is a plethora of gospel that is being preached and advice and the prophetic, any and everybody who believes that they have a right to do something, you have homosexuals preaching the gospels and attacking the anointed of Christ and people who are liberal theologians and backsliders and deceive people. You can find all kinds of idolatry, all kinds of things coming out of the occult and religious cults and unsaved people now on the internet. And if you don't know God, and if you don't know the word of God, you are not going to make it. I said that the number one source and the best tangible source to use to become acquainted or familiar with the Lord or to have a personal knowledge with him is to know the word of God. You must know the word of God and you must know it personally for yourself. The reason why the topic seemed to fall pressing into the presence of God so that you can know God is because God and his word is one. Whatever God is, the word is. Whatever God does, the word does. If the word says thou shalt not lie, that is who God is. And so to know God, you must know the word. Because when you know the word of God, you know the character of God. That is what we are striving to know, the character of God. So that when you hear a person says there's nothing wrong with it, God will approve of it. Or I do it and I don't see anything wrong with it. Or I have not received any conviction from the Holy Spirit for doing it. Those are people whose conscience are dead. And more than likely the Spirit of God has departed them as he did Samson. You see, when the Spirit of God comes, uh, He always comes with a demonstration and a banging noise like on the day of Pentecost. People get an encounter with God and they fall out uh, in the Spirit and sometimes you hear a bang or a crash or you hear the tongues bubbling forth out of their spirits. But whenever the Spirit of God leaves, nobody ever knows because He leaves quietly. And so when people say God isn't speaking to me about it, sometimes they are already spiritual dead. They have become, you know, those that God have given up over to a reprobate mind. And so in John 5, 39, Jesus tells us that the Jews searched the scriptures because they had a hidden agenda. And so we're commanded to be like the Bereans and search the word of God. And searching the word of God doesn't mean speed reading the Bible or skimming through the Bible. It means that you are diligent. You have more than one translation and you have commentaries and you have dictionaries because you are certain to find the truth. You are certain to understand what God was saying to Abraham that is now saying to me. What was God saying to the Jews that is now saying to me? What was God saying to the church at Philippi that he is now saying to me? This proverb that God 
God is saying to the Jews that we don't say in Jamaica or in Trinidad, what is it saying to me? And so we have to search the scriptures diligently. I also said that throughout both testaments, everyone who has ever known the Lord did so by either being in contact with the living word like Abraham and Moses did or by studying the scriptures uh, like the early church did in pursuit of knowing God. I said to know God isn't dealing with in this text. I'm not dealing with his mannerism or his, his personality. You know, some people say, well, um, one of his mannerism is like he chuckles a lot. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about knowing his character, what he stands for. God means what he says and he says what he means. Uh, and he's going to stick to his word. I also said that one reason why many Christians say, sin ignorantly is because they do not know God. They spent a lot of time in church. Paul spent a lot of time in the synagogues uh, in Jerusalem and sitting at the feet uh, of Gamaliel who was known as the glory of the law. But yet still Paul did not know the Lord. His first encounter with God on the day on his road to Damascus, when he had his encounter with Jesus, he said, who are you, Lord? He thought he knew the Lord, but he didn't know the Lord. The same thing with the scribes and the Pharisees. They boasted that they had the law of Moses. We've gotten everything that Moses wrote down that the Lord gave him. In the wilderness at Mount Sinai. But yet still when the living incarnate word stood before them. They did not recognize the great I am. Even through his preaching. They did not recognize Jesus. And what is happening. We are having a lot of people in church. And going to church. And talking scripture. But they still do not know the Lord. And so it is very vital. For us to stop living off. Of the, the experience of other people. And getting to know God. For ourselves. Because when you know God. You know that he's unchangeable. You know that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know that what God told Abraham was wrong is still wrong for you. Maybe 5,000 years later, it is still wrong. We must also understand that all the translations of the Bible say the same thing. I know sometimes some translations come under attack because it doesn't Line up like in the verbiage as the King James virgins put it. But at the end of the day, whether the Bible is written in paraphrase or it is literally written as the scroll says, all the Bible says the same thing because they speak against sin and endorse righteousness. I said that God is consistent in character and nature and has never changed who he is or his word to accommodate the lifestyle of anyone. And so when Miriam was gossiping, he dealt with that. When Samson was fornicating, he dealt with that. When Solomon walked away from God and began to practice idolatry, he dealt with it. It doesn't matter who you are. How much ties you give and how often you come to church, how charitable you are. God is not going to say, well, you know, I could, I could look past that. You know, 90% she's good. No, it doesn't matter who you are. He's going to deal with sin. I said, God is consistent in character and nature and has never changed who he is or his word, even when the intentions are well-meaning, but the execution is not in keeping with his word. And so after the burning bush experience, and Moses and God, Moses had this phenomenal encounter with God. He goes home and he gets his wife and his son and he's on his way to Egypt to do what God tells him to do. And God turns up to kill Moses. Why? He did not circumcise his son. 
God does not change who he is because your intentions are good. When God says this is to be done, it is to be done. And God means it. When the children of Israel took the R into battle as if it was some kind of, of magic wand. Uh, you know, they think that God was going to honor their battle, but no, they lost. Why? Sin was in their life. David brought the ark, uh, driven on a cart with oxen, and God didn't approve. So if what you are doing for God, as well-intentioned as you are, is not in keeping with God's word, he's not going to bless it. I talked about a well-known evangelist who said she gave a man $2 to buy a bear as a means that he would see the goodness of God and start going to church and get saved. And I said, since when does God have to use sin to accomplish righteousness? He didn't have to use it to convert the woman at the well of Samaria, Mary Magdalene, or Zacchaeus. I said, the Lord does not use sin to reach man and to bless man. Jesus does not and has never had to use sin to get sinners to come to church and to be born again. He didn't do it for Nicodemus. Simon of Cyrene, or the Pharisees who believed in him. Jesus said in his word, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And Jesus is lifted up when the gospel is preached and our lies are epistles read of men. Glory be to Jesus. And so that's a recap of what I did last week. I want to continue this week by starting with the next point, which states, the reason why lots of Christians believe everything they hear is because they do not know God. Now listen to an article that was written that, you know, everybody, some people within Christendom is circulating and it's like, look at God, look at God. He will reach you where you are, you know, that kind of stuff. But I'm saying when you know God, you would recognize error. It says a North African Muslim woman living in Southern Europe said she had a brain tumor and was not expected to survive. So she went to some of her Christian neighbors and missionaries and asked them to visit her family when she died. And they advised her to pray to Jesus for healing. And as she was praying, Jesus appeared to her and asked her what she wanted. And she told him, I've had a headache because there haven't been any cigarettes in the house for days. She said Jesus left her as abruptly as he appeared. And when she went into the kitchen to make herself a cup of tea, cup of coffee, sometime later, a package of cigarettes had appeared in her cupboard. Even though the Bible does not speak directly about smoking cigarettes or weed, and doing drugs. There are biblical principles or indicators in the word of God that identify accurately what is sin or what the Lord disproves of that definitely apply to these works of the flesh. And so the, the, they're saying that when the lady saw the pack of cigarettes, she became saved. So now Jesus has to give you a pack of cigarettes to get you to abandon Allah. To recognize that he is the one true and the living God. I'm saying when Christians do not know the word of God, they will believe everything that they hear. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not profitable. It was lawful for Jews to cut their hair, but it was unlawful for Nazarite to do that. So smoking and doing drugs is not profitable for the body because they destroy our health and flesh and the Bible views anything that destroys the body or God's temple unfavorably. Remember I said, the Bible does not mention smoking. You would not find smoking in the Bible. Anyone doing drugs, shooting it up their, their arms or snorting it through their nose or smoking, 
you know, Bristol cigarettes or whatever they have out there or doing weed or marijuana or crack cocaine. But there are scriptures that let us know when we are doing wrong. And so these things destroy the temple of, the, of God. And anything that destroys the temple of God is a sin. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. And so anyone who thinks that God has to give cigarettes or buy a bear for you to be converted. It is a person that does not know God. Are you hear what I'm saying? Because when you preach messages like this, people ask you for your doctorate and your in theology. They ask you for your degree, your master's, your PhD, your bachelor's. You don't have to have a bachelor or diploma in theology to make a stand, a sensible, credible stand for what the scriptures speak on. And so if you are doing anything, even when you refuse to eat food, to become anorexic, because you want to be a size zero, you are committing a sin because you are destroying the temple of the living God. Anything that destroys this temple is a sin. Even though the Bible does not speak directly about drinking vodka, alizé, rum punch, bloody mary, the warnings against indulging in wine and strong drink in the book of Proverbs apply. Proverbs 21, wine is a mocker and bear or strong drink. Wine is a mocker and bear or strong drink a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Proverbs 23, 32, wine bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. And when you look at it, Noah got drunk. And what happened? Lot got drunk. And what happened? What does the writer of Proverbs, I think it is Proverbs 31, he says, My mother told me, my father told me not to drink strong drink. Because anyone who does it will not make a competent ruler because it would rob you of your will. And so believers who tend to say, well, it's not in the Bible. Or they go to the scripture where Paul says to Timothy, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. And you see, when you don't search the scriptures, you don't know that Paul is not talking about wine that we drink. Timothy had an, an, an infection in his stomach. What, 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 what we call it, um... The water was contaminated. Uh, and so with the, he had dysentery. Women were miscarrying and people were becoming sick. And so in Israel at that time, it was a, a medicinal wine that was used. It was a medicine. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, who obviously believes in healing, drink some medicine to get your stomach better. He's not talking about becoming a wino. And so when people don't search the scriptures to know God, the Bible does not endorse the consumption of alcohol. So just like cigarettes and weed and alcohol destroys the body and the mind, we should not use it. Because cigarettes and weed and alcohol destroys the body and the mind and it should not be used. 1 Corinthians 3.17 says, If a man defies the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which ye are. You are the temple of God. So when you are Christian, when you are Christian and you are still struggling from smoking, if you used to smoke before you got saved, you need to pray and fast and ask God to deliver you from it. Christians should not be smoking. They should not be drinking alcohol. 
They should not be using medical marijuana. We have a God that is Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer. They shall not be addicted to prescription medication because whatever the devil can find, whatever loophole to get you hooked that he can destroy you, he will. Even though the Bible does not speak directly about gambling as a sin, it is. Gambling destroys homes and ruins the financial prosperity of millions. Uh, every day there are children that go to sleep hungry. There are families that are evicted uh, because of gambling. People lose their homes uh, and they lose their vehicles uh, and, and, and they steal from their jobs uh, to support the habit because that demon comes every now and again. Oh, if you can just get $10, uh, these are the numbers, these are the numbers. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If any man provide not for his own, and specifically for those of his own house, he have denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You see, addiction, some of us are already experiencing the symptoms of addiction. It's like when you play your candy crush, and you can't put it down just one more time. Just one more time. Just one more time. Nine o'clock, I'll finish at 9.30. Oh, there's five more minutes. It's an addiction. Because your mind or that spirit tells you, you're going to win it. You're going to crack the game. You're going to crack the game. Midnight, you haven't done it. And you have to keep going and going and going. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. And so once the devil gets you addicted, the only one that can release you is God by his power. The biblical principle and scripture that validates that this practice is wrong is 1 Corinthians 10, 31 that says, whatever you do, you must do to the glory of God. So I want you to picture yourself as a Christian, especially a Christian minister. And you have on your collar and your robe, and you get your bottle of wine or vodka and you just come to the street corner and you just pour and drink and say, this is going to give God glory. My neighbors are going to bow down and confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ha <laughs> ha. When people see you, they look at you with scorn and disdain because the ungodly know that this is not the manner with which believers should conduct themselves. And that's why the Bible says, whatever you're doing, eating and drinking, it must give God the glory. If it is not giving God the glory, you need to stop it. So this scripture is clearly saying that everything a Christian does must bring glory to the Lord. So smoking and doing drugs and drinking alcohol and gambling and occult behavior, behavior does not honor God or bring praise to his name. I also want to say here that the Lord has not changed his mind on tattoos. Leviticus 19.28 says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. If you got your tattoo before you are saved, you are forgiven. When you get the money, you can remove it. But when Christians take their Holy Ghost filled, sanctify self, and they decide they want to get a tattoo. Whether you get a tattoo of the cross, the Holy Spirit, Tweety Bird, your mother the dead, your mother died, R.I.P., whatever, your mother's name or your children's name. God says in his word that we are not to put any kind of tattoos on our bodies because it comes out of the occult. It comes out of the heathens worshiping their gods and tattooing the images and names of their gods on their bodies. A tattoo is a stumbling block. It opens the doors for demon possession. It causes people to become stuck in a season where they can't go over into a greater realm of glory because because you have given the devil place in your life. You are carrying his mark and his image. A tattoo is also a precursor for the mark of the beast. If you can take a tattoo you and you are left behind, you may very well take the mark of the beast. 
then their body perishes. The perishing of the tongues and the navel and all that stuff. The perishing of the tongues come out of the occult. The Aztecs pierce their tongues to get blood to make connection with the demons in the heavens. The pharaohs pierce their navel and believe that it will help them to gain entry into the afterlife. And so there's not every kind of piercing, because you can see my ears are pierced, and the Bible does in, endorse jewelry, but there are certain kinds of body piercing that is directly linked to the occult. So everything that looks like fashion, that you see the celebrities wearing, half of the celebrities are involved in the Illuminati and they come out uh, and they demonstrate what the devil has told them to do and present it to the world as if it is a new fad. And when script Christians do not search the scriptures, they don't know they're performing a demonic act. Demonic hairstyles, marking lines at one's temple with a razor. The Arabs use to show honor to their deity or at all by cutting the hair away from the temples in a circular form. Leviticus 19.27, ye shall not wrong the corners of your head. And so we see a lot of young men and we think that the barbers are artistic. And you don't understand. And sometimes they themselves don't understand. And some of them know what they're doing. They're putting a demonic hairstyle on your head. And when the devil gets the head, it's the central command unit. He can get you to do whatever he wants. For the Bible says the mark of the beast will be in the head and on the hands. Because whatever is in the head, the hands will do. The heathen shaved around their temples and ears and left a crown of hair on the top of their heads to honor their gods. And we see Christians going now and they're getting both sides of the hair. Everything is cleaned off on both sides. And some just have a little piece here and some have the Mohawk, which is a sign of rebellion from the hippie movement. Listen, we've got to search the scriptures. We've got to be well aware of what is going on. Many people like dreadlocks. They say it is easy, but dreadlocks draw a spirit of confusion and, and, a, spirit, and a spirit of deception to the wearer because it comes out of, 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 of that that, um, what, what you contamination between those who believe that Hail Selassie is a descendant of David and they believe that he is their God but it draws a spirit of confusion and spiritual deception to the wearer because you can never come into the knowledge of the truth of the word of God then you have believers dying there here in three and five colors at the same time this is a symbol of confusion and a lack of identity I could understand one hair color or going blonde or, or you, you know that kind of thing. But here's blue, there's green. You get yellow behind here, pink uh, and navy blue. That's a sign of a person that is confused. Uh, and so all of these things we see and we think it is fads. Uh, and because we see people that we look up to doing it, we figure it is okay, but you don't understand uh, you're performing demonic rituals. The key scripture that validates that these practices are wrong is Matthew 6.24, which says, no man can serve two masters. You can't love God and love the devil too. If the love in your heart is not for God, then the love in your heart is for evil. And one of the reasons why a lot of believers are suffering and they're hurting is because they don't know the word of God and they don't know God. And the sad thing about it is when you want to bring truth, they want to bite your neck off. And I say to people, I didn't write the Bible. God wrote the Bible. I remember when, when, I, when I backslid. And I knew from the get-go that wearing an anklet was wrong. But I was so free and I was so emancipated. I borrowed my sister anklet. She wasn't saved. I put it on my feet. 
I, I, I started to wear the shortest clothes around. I got a second hole put in my ear. I was free at last. Free. I was a law unto myself, and no one in the church was going to tell me that I shouldn't wear this because I was young and I was not an old woman, and I was going to live my life on my own terms. Remember, David said, let me read the text again from Psalm 25, verse 4. He said, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. And I was headed on the path of righteousness, for he leads us in paths of righteousness. And the moment I began to wear that anklet, I went on another path. And I walked some roads that I should not have walked. I did some things that I should not have done. And I would question myself, and I would say to myself, Heather, even as a human being, what you are doing is not really who you were. You're acting out of character because this is not you. You know, there are some people that would say to you, I'm not a Christian, but I would never do that because they have morals, they have a character. And when the Lord was finally able to deliver me, when I came to the end of me and I cried out to God on the 31st of January, 1993, and God totally revolutionized my life, I said to the Lord, why did I do what I did? Why did I do it, God? And he said to me, you know to where it was wrong. And the moment you put it on, you gave the devil the right to take you down the road of destruction. And I will never forget that as long as I live. What am I saying to us saints? Before you cut your hair, you need to do a research. Before you run and get a tattoo because the pastor's daughter has one. Because pastors are putting them on their bodies. There's another point I will come to next week about people who don't want to do God's will. You have pastors and their wives and their children putting on tattoos. And when we see people that we think that are at a higher level than we are doing it, we are saying to ourselves, well, if the bishop is doing it, it has to be okay. Not so. Because in the last days, many shall depart from the faith. But there will be a remnant like the 144,000 in this time before the rapture that will preach the gospel in spite of persecution. We're not to tattoo our bodies. We're not to be smoking and drinking and going to happy hour. We're not to be gambling. God does not give winning lotto numbers. He doesn't need the lotto. The gold and the silver, it says, every penny in the banks of America belong to God. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and everything in it. David said it. He said, Lord, everything belongs to you. That's, when, that's why when God comes to you by the Spirit and he says, the bank is going to pay the bill, and you're trying to figure, how God, who the money is his. The computer in the bank is his. He knows how to make journal entries. He knows how to transfer out of the reserves to your account. All you've got to do is just bless him. And I'm, I'm not saying this for people to get crazy. I'm saying it in line of the message. Everything belongs to God. Every time I see people migrate to Brooklyn, I say, God, I thank you for my loft in Manhattan. Everything belonged to God. Everything belonged to God. I'm not looking for a night job to get it. It belonged to God. Whatever he has for you is for you. And so we've got to know the word of God. And we've got to know God. And so how you dress must give God glory. Keep your breast covered. Keep your behind covered. Wear good underwear. There's some people, women that are wearing underwear and you think they're in a parachute. You know how they have you? You know that kind of stuff? 
some only one portion of the behind is covered and you wonder if they only buy half of the underwear. You need to wear proper underwear. You need to dress to give God glory. And it's no joke because you don't send off a good aroma as a servant of God when your underwear look jacked up. It doesn't look good. Whatever we do must give God glory. Whatever we do must give God glory. And the church is looking like the world. And you can't tell who belong to God and who belong to the devil. Because everybody wants to get trendy and everybody wants to be in style. But we are not called to dress like the world. The Lord said he has given the church garments for glory and garments for dignity. So when you know God, you know you don't do drugs, you don't smoke, you don't curse. God don't give people five minutes breaks. You don't pierce your tongue, your breasts, your navel. You don't cut off your hair like that. Yes, you can cut your hair. Sometimes you need to cut it back. If it has problems for it to grow, God understands that. But whatever we do, it must give God the glory. And so whether the Bible talks about smoking or drinking, if what you are doing is a destruction to your body, you are committing a sin. Stand with me, please, in the presence of the living Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise his name of God. Hallelujah. You know, there's a song to get herself. It goes, I'm going to live. The way God wants me to live. We've got to make that personal decision in this Christian journey. That it doesn't matter how others live their lives. I'm going to live the way that God wants me to live. It doesn't matter who wear mini skirt and who do what, what they do. I am going to live the way God wants me to live. You see Christian women dress so sexy. And they follow the Holy Ghost. Ooh, I'm going to live the way God wants me to live. Because everything that who, who is not the real Holy Ghost, there are people doing ministry from the, from, the, from the place of a familiar spirit. And so somebody has to set the standard. You know, if the sister that is with you, if she say, God, tell her to dress that way, you know God didn't tell her to dress that way. You just leave it alone and you live the life. We've got to stop allowing demons jumping on us and we converting, you know, to carnality and immorality and stand up as a light that shines in the earth and the salt of the earth. You don't have to be sexy to get a husband. You don't have to show your breasts to get a husband. When a real man of God is looking for a woman, he doesn't look for the trap. He looks for a lady of dignity. Hmm? Sometimes royalty, when they're young, they run around with all their private school girls, all the loose girls, whatever the case may be. But when they're ready for queen mother, they go for a lady. People are, who is she, who is she? Oh, she's the daughter of so-and-so. She's very decent. Da, 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 da. Every man is looking for a lady. Are you hearing me? Every man is looking for a lady. And so when you, when you dress like the king's daughter, you conduct yourself like the king's daughter, you don't have to worry about anything. When we are engaged in the occult and we don't know it, for the Bible talks about the unknown sin, it, it puts barriers before us. That prevents us from crossing into our seasons or even to prevent blessings from coming to us. And so I want to pray today that wherever you are, if it's not where you should be, if, if you're in season 9 and you should be in season 12, that, that by acknowledging that you've done something at some point in time that could have given the enemy the opportunity, one thing with the devil, when he gets you to do it, then he goes to God and says, I've got the right. To stop her from succeeding. Because the devil understands the judicial system. <clears throat> and he understands sin and the occult. It's, it's, it's what gives him the leverage to do what he does. One thing the Lord taught me from early. He says wherever sin is the devil has the legal right to be there. 
He says, sin is likened in the scripture to darkness. He says, wherever darkness is, the devil has a legal right to be there. And let's suppose you, you, you have unforgiveness in your heart. Wherever that place becomes dark. You see what I'm saying? Your mind might not be darkened, but once you are not releasing it, it becomes dark. And once it is dark, the devil will live there. He has the right to be in darkness. He will live there, and from there, he will seek to take over your whole life like a plague and destroy you. So you always say to God, wherever this blackness, wherever this darkness, wherever the enemy is dwelling, I cooperate with you now. And I repent in the name of Jesus Christ, and I command him to leave. I cast him out and send him back to hell in the name of Jesus, and I receive your cleansing. And so there's where we are going to go here today in this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, if I've done anything, if, I, if I've had any hairstyles when I was younger, I, I remember when I was younger, I had my hair cut on the side. Ignorant Christian didn't know. I, I just thought it was a style. So I had my hair like that. So, Father, anything we do, any anklets we've worn, any body piercings we've had, or even if you desire it, the Bible says it's already done. Once you want it, want it that badly, it is already done. Any occult desires we have on the inside of us, any things that we have worn, any, any clothing with patterns of demonic emblems in it, any smoking, any drinking, any gambling, any tattooing, anything at all, mighty God, uh, that relates to the occult, any magical books, and any supernatural movies, vampire movies, uh, and, and that kind of stuff, any music from the world that we are still holding on to, or we listen to that has demonic um, lyrics in it. Father, today in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, we repent of the sin of idolatry. We repent of the sin of idolatry. Anything that we have said and done, anything that we have in our possessions uh, that is unrighteous. You know, sometimes uh, they're believers and they say, well, you know, I grew up and I see my mother doing it. I've had more than one person say that to me, in, in, you know, a couple of years ago. They go to the religious store and they get their candles and, and they burn and the white candle is for this and the, the red candle is for this and they buy their incense uh, and they burn it. Listen. And you cannot practice genuine Christianity and go into the occult. When the Bible talks about incense in the Old Testament, it was symbolic of the praise and worship of the saints. It pointed to where you and I are now. So we don't need the incense because our worship to God is now the incense. And so whatever way the enemy can get us involved in idolatry to stop our future, to stop our prosperity, he would do it but in this service the spirit of God is here to heal the power of God is present to heal and to deliver and so we confess and repent of any and everything that we have said and done that pertains to the occult and idolatry, anything, any African dance or, or ritual that you have done, we repent of it. Not only African, but sometimes we travel and, and we, we think we're doing cultural stuff and we get involved in dancing and stuff like that. Any souvenirs that you have in your home, African mass and heads of gods and all this kind of thing. Uh, some people have the dream catcher and different things we bring that we think will cause us to sleep better. Some people have walking sticks that they get uh, from African chiefs and we bring these demon gods in our homes. Uh, and what these gods do, they act as a plague uh, and as a curse to withhold the prosperity of heaven. They shut down the heavens over your life. Uh, it affects the future of your children. And so we've got to come to the place uh, where we recognize the idea and we cast it out. Uh, sometimes we buy pictures of Chinese gods uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and we have idols in our homes uh, that war against uh, what God wants to do for us. Uh, sometimes we have gods of gold and silver and glass. Uh, if you want your success, uh, you've got to sprinkle, so to speak, uh, and get out all the foreign gods uh, that are among you, uh, that your prosperity 
can break forth. Things on the job will become better. Glory be to God. Healing will appear in your body because you can't hold a dead piece of steak and think that it has the power to heal you. It's a life from the pit of hell. There's only one God and he's the living God, the Father Jehovah. He's the Son Jesus Christ and he's the Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Numa of God in the Greek. And if it is not God, you are destroying yourself. And so, Father, today I believe for the anointing that destroys yokes. I believe that it is coming. He's coming upon every son and every daughter in this service today. I believe the Spirit of God is destroying the curse. He's destroying the blight. He's destroying the plague, the danger, the disaster, the omen. Everything the enemy sought to release against you and your household by your confession and repentance. In the name of Jesus Christ, when your mother-in-law comes to visit her and she still has has to do her superstitions you've got to take a stand and let her know this is a Christian house not in this house there can't be two gods in one house if God be God serve him she might be older than you but take a stand for righteousness take a stand for what is of God if your husband is doing it, pray it out, uh, pray it out, uh, pray it out in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, but we've got to do right by God uh, that the windows of heaven will be open over our lives. Uh, and so, Father, we recognize that we have sinned uh, and we have sinned against thee. Uh, we have bowed down to God's unknowingly, uh, but we confess and repent today in the name of Jesus. Uh, and we are thankful for the blood uh, that is able to make the vilest sinner cleaner. Uh, we repent of our sins uh, and the sins of our households uh, and the sins of our forefathers uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you God uh, that there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ to deliver and we thank you almighty God uh, for releasing the anointing of God now uh, for you are man of war upon the demons and devils uh, that has been warring against our success uh, and prosperity the demons and devils uh, that have been standing before us uh, to hinder our advancement that has been over us uh, that has made the heavens brass uh, because our help comes from above uh, I thank you now God uh, that there is a divine clearance uh, over our lives uh, there's a divine clearance mighty God before us uh, and behind us uh, to the right of us uh, to the left of us all around us uh, beneath us almighty God uh, you have cleared you have delivered Delivered. You have destroyed the yoke, and within our ruler measure, bind the works of demons and devils that is already bound in heaven, and we lose success, we lose prosperity, we lose miracles, we lose the goodness of God that make of rich and out of no sorrow. Today, Almighty God, we thank you for hearing, we thank you for healing, and we thank you for delivering. And Father, we make a commitment that we will read the word of God, that we may know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. Bless this offering today, God, that your people have so graciously given. Father, bless it and multiply it and increase it in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, that it is ever increasing in spite of what is in here today. I thank you that the more is coming. I lift every prayer request in this basket on the voicemail of the church and those that have been given to us personally. And I thank you, God, for making a way for your people. I thank you for healing and delivering and providing and for blessing, for causing your face to shine upon your people and doing good to them all the days of their lives. Now lift those hands now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne of grace, the only wise God in whom there's all dominion, majesty, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.